Hello, I'm Nicholas Garcia, and I'm from Troop 3519, and I've done costume design for the musical Once on this Island. The design concept my team has come up with is shipwreck. So my job as the costume designer is to embody the people living on the shipwreck. Each costume displayed has been inspired from the people from the Caribbean islands and their cultures. The young girl's outfit comes from present day, the present day children living in the lower class areas of the islands. Families wear ill-fitting old clothes sent in from family by the, from the US. The pink shirt is made to look dingy to contrast against the actor's skin. The orange is a separate cotton piece with the words Collins Bakery paint printed in cracked vinyl. Simple khaki shorts and sandals to adapt to the hot climate of the Caribbean, as well as for cost, for she is living in the lower class areas. Adding the mic pack to a small sleeve in the back of the shirt allows for full range of movement for dance. Timun's character moves and dances a lot, so putting her in a plain cotton dress allows for easy movement. The bright green of the dress stands against the lighter colors of the background. The faux leather vest balances the dress to the actor's skin. Most women, of the, most women of the Caribbean above the age of 10 wear a head wrap for religious reasons. Timun's head wrap is a solid dark purple satin to protect her skin and, and as well as to pull together the red of the pouch. The mic pack will fit, into, fit under the vest to not obstruct the actor's arms during dance. Erizuli's character is the goddess of love, jealousy, and passion. She's followed by many. The, the dress is a lightweight, flowy linen, so when the actress moves, it appears as if she's floating. Mm -hmm. Off the shoulder, ruffles are common in Caribbean fashion. The printed tartan hip skirt is part of the Caribbean religious wear, madras, to bring in the beauty of, the, of, the, of her people. The headpiece is to make the actress appear taller, as well as more estrogen. It's sewn into the it's sewn onto a black head wrap. Gold and silver jewelry is seen as a sign of wealth. Because of her godly status, she'll have gold and silver beads, earrings, and a necklace. The armband is to balance the flow of fabric moving in the opposite direction. Her mic pack will fit under the, her hip skirt to allow for the dancer to spin and for the pack to not fall. The goddess Asaka is the creator of earth and life. The bright little costume stands against the naturesque background. A golden sh char chartreuse hip skirt complements the bright yellow bodice to make her seem as the sun in the, in the scene. The black madras pattern will be printed onto the cotton, painted onto the cotton fabric for maximum flow and for practicality. The, arms, the arm sleeves are yellow vial to exaggerate arm movements for the actress. An illusion neckline for the regal look, as well as to not be as visible as possible. The headpiece is a lightweight golden, pla golden plated rods in silver because the actress moves a lot. The head wrap is black to give the look of only the headpiece being there, also to imitate the look of a sun. Asaka being the goddess being a goddess will have large traditional golden earrings to show wealth and status. The actor's mic pack will fit into a sleeve under the hip skirt. The elements from Daniel Bolzom's costume come from the richer areas of the Caribbean islands. The nature, the nature tones for the costume makes his character blend into the background more than the other actors. The soft linen for the shirt is for the actor's mobility in scenes. For the wealth status showing, the shirt has golden buttons and leather and with leather shoes with golden buckles. And lastly, his mic pack will fit under his tweed vest. Hi, I'm Janet Meza and I'm doing marketing on behalf of Troop 3519. As a marketer, I'm responsible for preparing, planning, and managing the promotional materials for our production, The Snow Queen. 
The Snow Queen's lighthearted yet dramatic stage adaptation of Hans Christian Andersen's classic fairy tale. It follows along the story of Gerda, a young girl willing to go on a far off journey in order to retrieve her friend Kai, who had been captured by the Snow Queen. We had three running show days going from December 19th to December 21st of last year. Marketing actions are taken care of by me with the guided help of our directors here at Cherry Theater Company. They provided the resources and materials I need along the way as the campaign further developed. I'm collaborating with the productions team by communicating with the scenic designer and light board operator to ensure we all had a consistent understanding of how we wanted to present the styles of the play. It was because of this collaboration and communication that the marketing design matched the production design by keeping the same color scheme that you see on our marketing materials also on stage. As for creative development, I find it best to work with a uh, main color scheme to carry consistency throughout the entire campaign. Navy blue inspired, inspires integrity and uh, honesty. Light blue promotes the cold and snowy icy feel of our show. Purple typically represents loyal, royalty, but in this case we kept a lighter shade to keep consistency with the lighter blue. White is Gerda's purity and innocence, and black is her strength as good defeats evil. We use these methods to attract the target audience of 1717, the plan uh, 17 years old. The plan fits into this demographic by keeping a fun, lighthearted tone to draw them in. We wanted to appeal to such a young audience in order to push the ideal of this being a family-friendly show where anyone can learn the value of friendship and how good always conquers evil. It was our collaboration with It was our collaboration with Georgia Wood Artistry, a local Houston artist and cosplay enthusiast, that we were able to create a character creation event where we engaged with our younger audience by inviting them to come in and get face makeup done in order to transform into either one of the Snow Queen's ice creatures or one of Gerda's guardian angels. We took to social media by using Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for advertising. Twitter was mainly used only to, sorry, Twitter was mainly only used to get enough attraction on its own while putting actual investment into Instagram and Facebook. There was a payment of $6 a day for four weeks on both platforms, amounting to a total of $48 spent. Uh, can I open the And in the end, we sold 395 tickets on opening night, 337 on night two, and 380 on night three, amounting to a total of 1,112 tickets sold. The rest of the budget went into buying 285 programs, 2,225 tickets, 150 posters, distributed across our schools, surrounding schools, and local businesses, with two press releases free of charge, uh, free of charge. These items on their own cost $366.25, amounting to a total spend of $415.25 spent out of a $500 budget. This is the original playbill from the show. Whenever I sat down with the director, because my job as the scenic designer is to take the director's ideas and visions and put them into a reality of a 3D model for everybody else to see, whenever we were co uh, conjugating, they heavily implied that it needs to have a very dark and gloomy feeling. It needs to make people feel how the other characters feel because the characters are dead. And it has to heavily emphasize that they are dead. Whenever I read that, I instantly did some research about the show and about Burns, and then I had sat down and watched the movie Friday the 13th to give me that dark and gloomy feeling. And while designing at the same time, I was listening to songs that were very dark and gloomy to help me put that image on paper for others to feel while they watched the show. The setting of the show, there are three urns that are sitting there. They are from three lovers, a man, a woman, and the woman that the man is cheating with. There are three urns, but I wanted to depict the scene to get more of a feeling of who the characters are. So in this scene, I picked colors and symbols that show 
who the characters are and why they are how they are. These are some of the color schemes that I was working with for each character to describe who they are, their personality. Some inspirational photos, we have some dark and gloomy environments and then we have the urn because the urn is a very important piece for the show. Whenever we were reading the show, we got a feeling that the author was trying to tell us that love can be taken advantage of, it can be taken for granted, so it's something that most people need to hold on to tight and that sometimes throughout love, somebody can be blinded by it and get hurt while they don't know it. So this is the 3D model of the show. I wanted to put it in a black box to give the audience uh, closer to the actors so they can get an understanding for who they are. So it is a 20 foot by 30 foot black box that is built on top of a proscenium stage. We have these elevations here so we can have two rows of, act, um, of audiences so the audience can feel like they are on the shelf as well with the actors who are sitting in the urns on top of the shelf. Behind the urns we have a backdrop that I had designed that it depicts three different shelves for each of the different uh, actors. On the first shelf we have here, this is the woman that he is cheating on his wife with. She's on the younger side, so I gave her um, music that depicts her younger, and it's uh, like, because people are younger, they have more energy, they're more agile, and the flowers because they see more beauty in life. The person in the middle is the man, and he's trying to get away from his wife without hurting her. So I put a, a representation of a motorcycle for one person to just go and leave, because he's trying to leave his wife and not make her as sad. For the woman, she is a very religious person, and it says in the text of the show, that she knows that he's cheating on her, but she's still trying to hold him because she still cares for him. So I put a cross and I put a family photo, or not a family photo, I put a photo of them too. So you get that feeling that she is still trying to hold on and not let him go even though he is trying to leave her. And on the front of the urns, I put the music symbol on because she loves to listen to music. That's what she likes to do. The football for the man is because he's, once you throw it to one person, leads from one and goes to the other. That's what he's doing with his love. He's trying to leave it from his wife and give it to the younger woman. And from the last turn, I put a tulip on there because she is still trying to keep that love and that romance with her and her husband as he's trying to leave. And on the underneath of it, there is, let me change the other, there is a, a, a these three colors that represent the personalities of each of the characters and how they all intertwine and intermingle with each other because they're all stuck in this mess together which is also why it is not a symmetrical shape at all and it's very rough and dirty and uneven because they're all stuck in this mess together and they all intertwine with each other. And that's all I can think of. Hi, my name is Ian Quimby. I am part of Troop 3519. The costume that I've constructed today is a reconstruction of my version of what I feel Jeannie would look like. So for the vest, I used a antique gold crepe uh, back satin. For the shirt, it was it's going to be paired with a blue poly satin. Uh, the pants are a royal penne velvet, with the sash being a cranberry poly satin, and the turban that you will see soon being a burgundy velvet. Um, so I'm going to get that for you right now. So what I did was I took a, for the, for the construction of the turban, I took a uh, hat, I cut the bill off, and then I just went around doing as how a turban would look, along with putting the jewels and the feather kind of to resemble how, uh, just kind of resemble how they have showed in all the things that I've seen for different uh, versions of him, uh, the little black feather, uh, as well as the jewels. And then I also made a little beard out of EVA foam, off of what I've seen, taking the inspiration off of what I've seen from when I was growing up as a child, which is what I mainly based the colors off, as you can see right now. Um, <clears throat> so I, I made that out of EVA foam with a little string of elastic under it, hot glued together uh, as well. So the reason I chose the colors that I did for both the actual costume and then the turban that pairs with it is because I've always imagined the genie as a person that you would see of power. Because, as they say, both the films that they've made of Aladdin and then also the musicals and plays, he is a being of unimaginable power with a very tiny, a very tiny living space. 
uh, but also with chain links or chains, or cuffs, keeping his power at bay, to where he can only grant three wishes to the master that rubs his lamp. So what I did for the uh, what I did for the cuffs was I also made them out of a uh, EVA foam, but I also decided to spray paint them gold and add. Uh, as you can see right here, elastic to keep it on the arm so it'll be for easier removal and easy putting on. I also decided to add a little chain because what I've always imagined whenever I thought of the genie was that whenever he has been in the lamp, because uh, as he says in almost every time that we see him, he's been in there for one million or one thousand years. I've always imagined him chained up to the actual wall with his wrist up and his uh, chains like that with his feet bound together. Um, so that's how I've always thought of them. So I had thought, I figured I might as well add that in. Uh, and just the main reason I chose uh, chose costume construction for Genie is that he's just always the Genie character has always been, you know, like a being that you've seen who always is able to pick everybody up, who's always comedic and wisecrack at everything that he's done, is able to make friends along the way, but is also betrayed by those that he might know, uh, mainly coming from the main villain. Uh, as well as uh, whichever sidekick that he would normally have. Um, let's see, what else is there? Uh, so the personality is mainly, the personality of the genie has always been one that's more, a little bit comedic, but always is one that you know that you can count on whenever something might go wrong. Uh, which is how I've always imagined Genie more of like as a supportive comedic character um, instead of like a side character as some might view him. Um, thank you for your time and that's been my classroom construction. <laughs>
we introduced the Terry Choir and the Terry Band, who have been working hard at the rehearsals, as you can see. And uh, the, ter uh, the Terry Band has also been rehearsing, and with the dramatic sound cues and instrumental effects that the actor, with, uh, to go along with the actor singing. And if you need more information, go to terrytheatercompany.weebly.com. As for the budgeting, we were given $500 poster printing. We printed 100 posters, and what we want to do is target the audience, since it's like more of a high school play, just set it around school and to local venues like maybe gas stations or uh, places that people can pass by publicly. Our poster printing equaled out to $7 because they were $0.07 cents each. Ticket printing was free from the school, and program pr uh, printing turned out to be 55 44 We printed 292 programs, because that's how many seats we can fill. Our Instagram ads, to upload them, cost six fifty. Our ticket sales turned out to be $3,480. Our school contribution was the ticket uh, fee. It was paid it for us. So it was $0.20 cents per click on our ad, so which equaled out to $6, so we didn't make much profit. So, aside from everything from marketing and the budget from the production, it equaled out to 2980 on profit. And the prices were six, the tickets were $15 each, but $7.50 if you had your cost to one. Hello, my name is Chance Thompson from Troop 3519 and I am doing sound design for the play Woman in Black by Stephen Milletrap. Uh, my whole job as sound designer is to emphasize the emotions that are felt throughout the play and do this through sounds, cues, effects, etc. So Woman in Black is a horror-based play that is a retelling from a man who had a paranormal encountering while doing his job at a town that he lives in from. So while researching for this play, I was going through the sounds and there was a lot of more older sounds since this play is based in the 1800s. And my team and I came up with a unified design concept of loneliness and animosity. The loneliness is because throughout the play he is stuck in a house by himself and it is in the kind of swamps. And then the animosity because as he continues in this house he learns more about the ghost and he gets further and further away from normal society. Uh, ways that my team and I have worked together is during certain scenes, as we'll see later with the horse and trolley, uh, we see that this is Mr. Kipps' only way back to society. So whenever there is this horse and trolley, he is very relieved to see it. So the way we're gonna show this was have the construction crew make it, make the trolley white to represent a more holy atmosphere and have the lights follow it with my sounds being pretty normal. But there are a few times where it is a nightmare horse and trolley, where it's a ghost kind of sounding. And during this, we don't see the horse or the trolley, so we have to rely solely on the sounds to get through with our feelings. Uh, for the script requirements, there are plenty of sounds, most notably a lot of horses, voiceovers, and birds. There are about two pages. Um, all of it is required, but there are a few sounds that I've added in, like the lights that are buzzing and the different sounds for the dialogues. Uh, so while making my sounds, the whole idea, as I said, was to be ominous and to elevate the fear and suspense that the audience are feeling as the play goes on. Uh, as we'll I'll show with the alive horse and trap, it sounds. Hold on. Uh, the 
live horse and trap. It is a pretty normal sound compared to the ghost horse and trap. which is a lot more chaotic to really make everyone wonder what actually happened. So finally, we also have the sound of the woman in black. And my whole plan was to have this playing whenever the woman in black was on stage and present having it very low, that way people could barely hear it, as they could barely see the woman in black. But it's still present. And finally, the light buzz is there just to kind of make the scene more eerie and make you feel more in the what's going on. All these sounds, I used free sounds and zap splat to get the samples and then I use Audacity to mix them. So for Woman in Black, I took a violin sound and I slowed it down. I took out any background noise and I distorted it so that it was more atmosphere, more like a outworldly kind of feeling. For the horse and traps, I would go and overlay different sounds. So there was the horse galloping, there was the trolley. During the ghostly one, there's sounds of the night, there's the mud and the trees. There's when they go and run into the trees, I have it so it's reversed. So it sounds like they're speeding up. And that's it, very noticeable in the rest of my sounds, which we can see a list of the finalized sounds right here, including the three that we, the four we just showed. So this has been my presentation, thank you. Hi, my name is Chelsea Lujan, I am from Troop 3519, and I will be showing my designs from the musical Alice in Wonderland, written by Janet Yates Falk and Mark Friedman. Um, as the theme of the show, we decided that uh, the theme would be, or we thought that the theme would be, don't be too quick to grow up. Therefore, as the directors and designers, we all wanted to portray this, this theme towards the audience. And we decided that it would be a good idea to have a child's mind play throughout the musical. It would be a colorful, it would be, uh, the lights would be showing every feeling that the child, uh, that the characters of the musical portray. Um, we, we had our designs, um, sorry, our, our musical take place in the 1860s. Therefore, all of the designs will be from the 1860s. It was um, going into towards the Civil War and uh, the designs were very influenced by uh, the military and by uh, upper class people. For the Queen of Hearts, we decided not to portray her as a scary person, more that her colors would show her attitude towards things. Therefore, uh, red because she's a Queen of Hearts, but also red because it would show her um, her attitude, being bossy, and bringing that intense into a room every time she comes in. Her um, dress is red satin, and the uh, black part of the dress, which is the second layer of her dress, would be uh, black polyester with texture, and uh, she would have gold lace on the edges of her dress um, because she is royal, uh, 
but she's the Queen of Hearts, so therefore purple, it really, really show her royal side, and the gold would really show her royal side instead. The Knave of Hearts, he is, he does not like the Queen, but every time she's around, he follows every single commandment that she has for him, and he he feels that intensement that the queen brings. Therefore, we um, therefore he reflects the same colors that the queen has, and also it would be a red cotton and a black and black cotton with a gold lace and gold gloves and a gold um, gold gold lace and gold gloves and gold buttons. These were also show that he is part of the royal um, military or royal guards for the queen and this is how we have uh, this is how we have reflected uh, the knave's personalities onto his costume for the mock turtle the mock tur uh, turtle is um, portrayed as an elderly man throughout the musical he is wise he gives advice to alice talking about um, being young about cherishing moments and uh, he is, since he is an elderly man, he decided to go with darker colors with him. He is, he also has bright colors, but the bright colors are to show that he is a happy man. And the darker colors are to show that his age. His suit, or his, his suit would be also, uh, would have the, de the designs of a turtle shell. And um, he would be colorful. And then the, shell would be made of um, cardboard and also it would have it would be colorful full of all the green that the vest has the pants are uh, black cotton and he would have a cane to show that he is an elderly man and, that, and walk like one too the mad hatter he is he encourages alice to um, find Wonderland. He shows her how to find Wonderland, but most importantly, he encourages to find Wonderland. Uh, and he is a very, uh, he's very encouraging throughout the musical towards Alice. Therefore, we used uh, purple and turquoise to reflect his personalities because although he may have like a, um, he may be he acts very upper class. He is very, uh, he is very proper. He is very gentleman. Therefore, we put, um, we used purple to show his uh, gentleman side, but a turquoise, a bright blue, a bright turquoise because of his happy personality and of uh, being a very good uh, friend of Alice's. Lastly, Alice, she is happy, but she has trouble throughout the musical of being considered an, an older girl, an older woman. She wants to be, uh, she doesn't want to be called a child anymore. She wants to be that older teenager, like all the other girls, or um, yes, like all the other girls. Therefore, her colors are more faded because they're not as bright as a child's life would be because she's kind of fading away from that life. She doesn't want to be a child like that no more. She wants to be considered an adult person. And so her blue would be a light blue um, that um, would show her fading away from being a child. And then the white and the rest of the white would be of showing her innocence of still being a child and her personality of being, of not, sure if being a child is what she wants anymore because an adult is taken more seriously and these are my designs for it. my name is lomali mercado i'm from troop 3519 i'm doing marketing design for life is a dream by pedro calderon de la barca a play about a prince who was locked away by his father due to a prophecy that claimed he would be an evil ruler. My role is to organize posters and tickets 
that could attract a person walking by. I also come up with ways I could advertise the play with also targeting my main audience and use my budget wisely. I started off with reading the play and cooperated with my cast, crew, and uh, directors to see their ideas for the show, such as colors, the lighting, and theme of the story, which I used to come up with my main audience, who are the bilingual Latinos and or of Spanish descent. Seeing as the show is performed during Hispanic Heritage Month and the play is a Spanish language play, I organized a color scheme of orange, black, and white um, for the tickets so there's not too much color and it focuses on just the orange, which is most of the information. With the posters, I picked a background that would summarize the play. I used stars shining over a mountain to signify the prophecy and where Segismundo, the prince, was kept. And to make it a little bit more obvious, I put uh, a, sha a dark shadow of a face to represent Segismundo. To attract more people, I set up raffle tickets for a dollar three weeks before the show with a prize of two Saturday tickets for the show and a backstage tour on the development of our program. We sold them during our school lunch as well as the show tickets, which are $10 for adults, five for students, and three for kids, and are also being sold online on our theater department website. We distributed approximately 15 posters throughout the school and the remaining 30 around Brazos Town Center, where most of the Rosenberg population goes to eat and shop. We've also given 10 raffle tickets to individual troop members to sell during the weekend so that way we can get as many people as possible to buy raffle tickets and show up to the Terry Auditorium two days before the show to claim the prize if won. I also advertised on both Instagram and Facebook and Twitter uh, so I can reach the most of my audience. To advertise on those socials, it cost us $48 along with the amount it took us to print posters, which added up, which added up to be $498.99, along with the raffle tickets and the rest of the, uh, the budget. And my total budget was 500 so it gave me a dollar and one cent left over. But we sold over 387 tickets and 243 raffle tickets that added up to be $2,952, making more and way over my budget and leaving the, the audience happy with their show.